Welcome to the grand opening celebration of the Children's Mercy Research Institute. We're so glad you're here to join us. This is how our journey started. The Berry sisters, two women who founded Children's Mercy in 1897, dreamed of a dedicated research center 120 years ago. Now, thanks to the new Children's Mercy Research Institute, we are poised to be one of the top children's hospitals in the country. And because the kids of Kansas City and our region deserve the very best, we now have 375,000 square feet of dedicated space focused on accelerating answers for kids that will allow the brightest minds to come together to solve parents' heaviest questions every day. We made it to this point only because of the generosity of the Kansas City community. In 2018, two longtime Kansas City families the Halls and Sunderlands showed us just how much they care about the kids of our community by each giving $75 million, a combined $150 million, the largest gift ever given to pediatric research to begin construction and development of the Children's Mercy Research Institute. Since then, hundreds of members of our community have joined their generosity and made this research investment a reality. We started with dreams and concrete, and what you, our community of champions, have created for kids is just stunning. We can't wait to show you a glimpse of what your gifts will make possible. Better treatments, long-awaited diagnoses, and even cures. On behalf of all of us at Children's Mercy, thank you. Thank you, Paul, for showing us how far we've come. Now it's time to show you the magic inside this amazing building. Hi, I'm Kat, your host for tonight's grand opening. But I'm more than just a host, I'm also a Children's Mercy patient. I have polycystic kidney disease, known as PKD, which is a genetic condition, and I've spent lots of time here at Children's Mercy. Like many of the kids' stories you'll hear tonight, I am hoping and waiting for research to find better treatments or even a cure for PKD in the future. I will need a kidney transplant when I'm older, but wouldn't it be so amazing if research was one step ahead of me and they could discover a medicine to cure my PKD without a transplant? I can't even imagine how that would change my life and the lives of so many other kids and families like mine. The work happening inside this building is really amazing and I can't wait to tell you all about it. But first, I want to start by introducing you to Dr. Tom Curran, the Chief Scientific Officer and Executive Director of the Children's Mercy Research Institute. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Curran. Thank you, Kat, for such a great professional introduction. Uh, it goes without saying that we wish we were here in person celebrating with you tonight on this very special day. But this year has not made that possible. There is light at the end of the tunnel, and that light came from research that led to better treatments and spectacular new vaccines for COVID-19. Many of our investigators are involved in those studies here in Children's Mercy in Kansas City. And that was made possible by your bold investment in research, which drives scientific progress and discovery. The future health of our children depends on this investment. As we've experienced in this uh, quest, COVID-19 taught us several lessons. We need to look at the individual. We need to take a precision medicine approach. Why is it that some children do very well and some children have very uh, serious disease? We're leading the quest for so many other answers too, from ADHD, medication dosing, to cancer treatments and rare diseases, and so much more. The Children's Mercy Research Institute has four main areas of emphasis that support all of research. 
the Genome Center, Precision Therapeutics, Population Health, and Healthcare Innovation. I'm going to turn it back over to Kat in a moment, and she'll take you on a tour of the building and explain more about these areas of emphasis and demonstrate how this research will actually impact the health of kids, not just in Kansas City, but across the US for generations to come. On behalf of the thousands of families who come to Kansas City seeking answers and the millions of families across the world, I want to thank you for your support and I promise we will deliver the answers you seek. We're so excited to celebrate the opening of Children's Mercy Research Institute with you, knowing that this research institute will be a beacon of hope for the kids, of the community, and beyond. To every donor, every employee, every single member of our community who has helped make Children's Mercy Research Institute a reality, thank you. I know it's been a challenging year and we're amazed at your dedication to the kids of Kansas City. You know, we come back every year, we see you guys, and I know what you do. Your joy, your wisdom, your presence are such a gift to every child and every family. Families come to you on one of their darkest day, and you shine a bright light of hope in their lives. This is an incredible day of hope for our entire community. On behalf of the Big Slick hosts, um, I, I wish that I could be there with you today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. The Children's Mercy Research Institute is home to one of the top genomics programs in the country. I'm excited to turn it over to Dr. Tomi Pastinen to help explain why genomic testing will be a hallmark of CMRI and why it's so important for kids. So Children's Mercy has a tradition in uh, pioneering genetic analysis for disease and Children's Mercy Research Institute has taken the task to really elevate that to a new level nationally and internationally by having a program called Genomic Answers for Kids that aims to be the leading edge of our genomic medicine initiative looking to improve the diagnosis rate reduce the time for diagnosis and really start to change the game for, for a lot of these rare diseases that are underserved currently in research and in clinical care. The genomics in the Research Institute is a foundational program. Uh, we believe that many of the diseases in children have their foundation in the genome. The genome plays a much bigger role even in common diseases but particularly in rare diseases that are often severe. Genomic Answers for Kids is allowing us to do first generation DNA sequencing to diagnose a rare disease that cannot be discovered by any other technology and we will be the first one to offer it clinically but also offer to thousands of rare disease patients across our area. The most important impact is in the person, in the family who can receive now diagnosis many years ahead of time to the usual wait of five to seven years for, for receiving a diagnosis. The Genomic Medicine Center was the first one to move into this new beautiful CMRI building that wouldn't have been possible without the generous donations from our key donors. And really their vision is helping us to build a world leading research hub right here in Kansas City. because here I am in a, in a robot screen. Well, now that you're here, let's go talk to Dr. Faruqi at the genomics lab. Hey, Eric, what are you doing here? Hey, Dr. Faruqi. Well, I couldn't miss this exciting moment. So I had to wiggle my way in there. Wish I could be there in person, though. Yeah, we all wish you could be here, too. But hey, come follow me. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for getting me. Thank you, sir. Like trainer on Seinfeld, I'm about to make a big entrance. Yes, you Here are. We go. Uh, no. <laughs> oh, 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 there we go. <laughs> Since we're uh, uh, alone inside the lab now, I'll take off my mask. Hey, there, there you are. <laughs> nice to finally meet all of you, Dr. Faruqi. Thank you, sir. And thank you also for all the work that you do with uh, Big Slick and, and uh, the annual fundraiser. It, 
uh, really lets us do great things for our patients here. Uh, thanks to all of you, we are um, now uh, able to sequence the genome of every child with cancer who's seen here at, at Children's Mercy. Um, and it's, it's a really, really great thing. We do it on these instruments here. Now, what is that? What is that behind you there? These are a, a couple of our different sequencing instruments. Um, and they, they allow us to look at the genome of a child's tumor cells and normal cells. Um, and looking at the tumor cells and the tumor DNA, we're hoping to find mutations specific to tumor cells. And these allow us to hit the tumors with certain drugs uh, that uh, kill only tumor cells and spare the normal uh, cells. So this is really different from traditional chemotherapy. And it's um, a great example of precision and personalized medicine. Wow, that's great. So am I to understand that this, these two machines, or maybe there's more, but these machines allow us to keep ahead of the cancer rather than playing catch up to it? That's uh, exactly right. It allows us to get families into screening and, and uh, catch it before it uh, uh, becomes uh, too late. Well, this is really great. I, I know that when, when families see this, we talk about with the diagnosis of cancer, it's important to remain uh, hopeful. And these things here at Children's Mercy should give every family member um, hope that uh, hope is always always on the way and we're doing our best to make sure we stay ahead of the disease of cancer rather than playing catch up to it. Thanks to people like you and your staff there. Well, thanks for showing me around. This has really, really been fun uh, playing the role of robot. Uh, yes, and uh, thanks to uh, you and the Big Slick fundraiser and all the donors. It's, it's a really great and exciting thing. We're hoping it'll really uh, help lead to some amazing breakthroughs in pediatric cancer. Dr. Faruqi's work is truly amazing. Now, let's watch a story about Clara, a two-year-old girl, and we'll see how genomic testing saved her life. Um, before her diagnosis, Clara was always who we always called our easy child. Um, she, you know, was never really sick. She was always happy, cheerful, smiling. Um, and in many ways, she still is. She just has this diagnosis. Clara is an adorable little two-year-old who came to us in December with a new limb. So her parents were concerned that she had some pain uh, and brought her in and she was evaluated and she had x-rays done which showed some potential abnormalities inside of her bones. During that same admission, um, her blood work um, and her bone marrow biopsy confirmed her diagnosis of leukemia. And we got her port placed, we start, started chemotherapy all within that week. But they did tell us that she had a very good prognosis and you know she would handle this very well and she has. What is that? A bumblebee. Oh yeah. It's actually been dare I say better than I expected. <laughs> um, you know this was all new to us initially but we had very complex discussions about all the different drugs that she would be treated with and all the different ways she could be given treatment. So far knock on wood we've, we haven't had many bumps in the road. Clara enrolled in a children's oncology group clinical trial, which is actually an international clinical trial for children that have standard risk acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL. There really was no question whether or not we would enroll in this clinical trial because I, I felt like that was the only way to make sure we had the most successful treatment for her. All of our patients are able to benefit from cancer genomics that goes on inside our own walls in the Children's Mercy Research Institute. We're really fortunate to be able to have the support of donors to build a biobank. We test the leukemia for every child that comes with new diagnosis of, of leukemia. We test the genetics of their cells. And within a few days, we already knew that she had what we would consider a favorable type of ALL, or a type that we would expect should respond well to chemo. We're great, very thankful that there have been others in the past that kind of paved the way to her treatment, um, which gives us a lot of hope. And we are looking forward to becoming a part of that history and helping children like Clara in the future. Research is important because it's the reason why we can cure cancer. Without research, 
we wouldn't be this far. We wouldn't be able to offer the cures that we can offer. We have lots of research going on in the Children's Mercy Research Institute. It's a really exciting time. With the building of some of our new labs, we're actually gonna be able to design and invent brand new therapies that will target directly to what the patients are experiencing with their cancer to hopefully improve the survival rates. My hope for her is that she doesn't let this diagnosis um, you know, dictate her potential for the future. I think she has a very bright future and this, I don't think this will stop her from doing what she was meant to do. Wow, I'm learning so much. How about all you at home? I'd love to hear from you at home. We just open the chat function, so leave a comment or a question and we'll try to answer it as we're going through the tour. Okay, so who's with me this time? Oh, it's Dave Kepner! Hi, Kat! Hi! How are you? Good, how are you? Well, I'm among the best, but I rarely try, so we can only imagine what we're missing. <laughs> hey, Kat! Yeah? Oh, Kat, where are <laughs> we right now? We are on the second floor collaboration space, and if you turn around, you can see the amazingly pretty view of Kansas City. All right, can, may I turn around now? Of course you can. All right, come on, Rex. Let's have a little look-see-seezy, a little peek -see. Oh, look at that. All right. Downtown Kansas City. Hey, Kat. Yeah? Who's hanging out with you today? Well, I definitely want you to meet somebody. It's Dr. Goggin, and she is in charge uh, of population health, so I'm going to send you right on over to her. I, I get to meet Dr. Goggins right now? Yeah, of course you do. Kat, I'm nervous. I'm a big fan. <laughs> Don't be nervous. She's amazing. Okay. Hi, David. I'm Dr. Kathy Goggin, and I lead population health here at CMRI. Population health, I have to admit, I am immediately out-referenced. What's that mean? You're, you're not alone. Um, population health is actually a newer area of uh, science, and what it does is it brings together lots of different types of scientists to work together to try to figure out how to get the best health care and health for everyone. You, you've probably heard of health disparities, um, the fact that yes. some people are at you know, higher risk for diseases and have worse outcomes than others. Yes, I have heard of it. And it's, it's a complicated interaction between lots of factors, like some of these genetics, the physical and social environments that they grow up in, uh, their beliefs about health, and then how care is actually delivered. That's exactly what we do in, in population health. We, we work with the communities that we care and serve to try to understand the reasons and then create equitable solutions so that everyone has a chance at the very best health and the very best health care. Wow. I gotta say, I am grateful for you and, and people in your field of study. Well, I totally appreciate that, but the beauty of my role is that I just bring a lot of really smart people together and, um, and then we try to geek out together and figure out how we can get there with our, with our partners in the community who are really the experts on their lives and their diseases. Um, so it's, it's a joy. We're hoping that this space is gonna be filled with groups like that. People who come and actually are passionate about making a difference in folks' lives. Absolutely. Wow, and this all fits perfectly within the paradigm of what population health is all about. You're my new expert. <laughs> I, would, I would keep looking. <laughs> so now we have a, um, a video of Dr. Bridget. Yes. She's doing fantastic work on asthma in children. Ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to introduce to you uh, the person and the work of Dr. Bridget Jones. Thank you. know now that asthma is not the same in everyone, that there are different what we call phenotypes in asthma. So the underlying drivers of asthma are different from person to person. Due to racial inequities um, in our country, there are some children that are maybe more exposed to things like pollution or other environmental triggers in their home. There are financial inequities that lead to lack of access to adequate treatment. African American and black children, as well as Hispanic children, 
have increased asthma prevalence rates, they have increased morbidity and mortality compared to white children. If we are really able to understand why is it that black children are getting asthma at higher rates and dying and are not responding to treatments as well, what are the true drivers of that? That's when we can make an impact. That's when we can see these health disparity gaps start to close. Our work that we've done with Operation Breakthrough has really been important. One of the unique things that we identified was that racism impact asthma outcomes in these young children. Studying populations like the Operation Breakthrough population who may not always have opportunities to be included in research are really important because I think that's when we're really going to identify some of the unique aspects that drive disease for these children that are really highly impacted. You know, our mission is to create a world of well-being for all children. And so I think as an institution, that definitely is our duty to understand not just what happens when the child comes into our environment to make sure that they're getting equitable care, but also what are all the factors outside before they come here. As a pediatric researcher, that's my goal, is to really impact large groups of kids and understand all of the drivers that are causing disease in these large groups of kids that we see significant health care disparities in. I think the CMRI is really essential in getting Children's Mercy to become a national leader in pediatric research because it provides that optimal environment. I think about what children think when they drive by and see this big beautiful building and I'm really excited that we're gonna have some opportunities to bring community children into the CMRI to see the research that's done, to actually maybe participate in some of the research. So I think it plays a significant role in the present for research at Children's Mercy and for our community, but also really importantly for the future. the last part of the tour and I'm really hoping David was right and I'll get to see Rob Riggle. Looks like the robot's already in there and he's talking to the man, the myth, the legend, Dr. Steve Leader. Hey Rob, uh, what are you doing? Hey Doc, how you doing? I'm just grabbing my soup out of one of these microwaves. I can't remember where I put it. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, um, these are actually hybridization incubators. Um, I'm not sure we have any microwaves on this floor. Oh, oh, ha! Yeah, no, I get, yeah, I get the incubation thing that you just said. So, not a microwave. Um, cool. I probably just put it uh, in the microwave on a on another floor. Hey, Doc. While I'm here, though, um, you want to show me around? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Let's go for a walk. Let me tell you a little bit about the uh, program, the Goldilocks program here. Goldilocks, that's a great name. I love that. Genius. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, the goal of the program is to find the dose, as you might uh, expect, that's not too big, not too small, just right for each patient. Uh, no parent, in fact, thinks their child is just average. Uh, neither do we. So we try to find those, um, those uh, factors or characteristics that make each child unique and use that information to um, provide safer and effective uh, use of the medications that we use. That's, that's awesome. That's pretty clever, actually. So uh, tell me more about it, Dr. Leder. Conducting the research is just one thing. You have to be able to develop tools that allow doctors to use the information. And so what we learn in precision therapeutics, we hand off to the uh, therapeutic innovation group who builds the, t the tools that doctors can use. And then the, um, the other group in the Research Institute, the Population Health and Outcomes Research Group, tells us how effective uh, these tools are and how we can improve them. So it's a, a big circle that includes all of the major areas of emphasis here in the uh, Research Institute. That's outstanding. I mean, it's so individualized, so efficient. Good job, Doc. Yeah, oh, thanks. Well, that's the, uh, that's the goal, and it's a lot of fun. Um, and a really, really important piece of it is the partnerships that we form with the patients and their families that allow us to, um, to be able to do this work. You can't do it just in a lab. You have to do it with the patients and their families, and we really appreciate 
the opportunity that we have to work with them and, and get them engaged in the whole process. That's really cool, Doc. Well, that about does it for the lab. Um, how about we go outside and see Cat? Let me get the door. Thanks, Doc. Appreciate it. Hey, Doc, if you find that suit, let me know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, Cat. Nice to meet you. Hey, Rob. Nice to meet you, too. You really should meet Ben. He can tell you how Goldilocks helped him use his ADHD medication more safely. Cool. Let's go meet him. I first noticed it. I was in the car headed back from wrestling practice. I'd already showered, changed. It's been like at least half an hour to 45 minutes since I stopped doing any physical exercise. I could just feel my heart just like a thumping out of my chest. Ben mentioned that his heart rate was almost always over 100. When I asked how he knew this, he said it was from some kind of app on his phone. My first thought was that it was just wrong. So I actually dismissed it initially, but he insisted that it was accurate. In the following days, I went down to his room early in the morning before he was up and checked his heart rate at that time and it was over 100 um, while he was still kind of resting in bed in the morning. So at that time he was in sort of peak condition. He was 16 and a wrestler, very, very fit. And so his heart rate should have been significantly lower than that. As I began thinking about this fast heart rate and asking myself what could cause it, I started to worry. But at the end of the day, it was just my mom instinct in knowing that something wasn't quite right. So the next step, my mom took me into Children's Mercy. I got my blood drawn. The blood working came back and the test was through. And my mom was almost excited <laughs> about it because we had an answer to our problem. Our team found that Ben has a change in his genetic blueprint, which causes him to break down some medicines very slowly, including the medicine he was taking for ADHD. So what that means was the medicine was building up in his body, causing some very frightening symptoms. This gene, cytochrome P450-2D6, or CYP2D6 for short, is a gene that we all have, and we all have uh, different sort of versions of it. Our world-class researchers have been pioneering our understanding of CYP2D6 since we first discovered its role in the breakdown of medicines. The particular change that Ben has is a rare one, and so it's not widely tested for, and that's one of the reasons why we were extra lucky to be able to get the test run through the research lab at Children's Mercy, because if he had had just a regular, widely available commercial test, they wouldn't have found it. He would have come out with the normal result and we wouldn't have gotten the answer that we needed. The very first thing we did was just lower his dose. We were able to sort of confidently make that change and know that um, he should tolerate it better, but also still have the effect that he needed. For as long as I can remember, I've had ADHD and I've been taking ADHD medicine. I was relieved knowing that I was on the right medication. What's also important to, to think about or to know um, and very beneficial for us is that lots of different medications are metabolized or processed by this gene. And so this will be a piece of information that then will carry forward and be able to have physicians act on for the rest of his life. It's definitely going to be helpful later on in life knowing that I have a specific genetic variation that does affect how some medicine metabolizes in my body and I'll be able to use that going forward. I think about genomics really being at the front edge of what we're doing, helping us to diagnose diseases better. Precision therapeutics is really that next step, understanding how to find the right drug for the right patient at the right dose exactly when it's needed. Ben's story is powerful, but we truly appreciate Ben's leadership because Ben represents hundreds of thousands of children all across the country who share his association with ADHD. Ben had a specific gene variant, and many kids in the country have that same variant. They deserve the same kind of precision medicine used to treat Ben. We thank Ben for sharing his story to the entire world. Isn't that 
that story incredible? Here's something cool. In the dark, the actual DNA sequences of children diagnosed at Children's Mercy will light up the windows of CMRI. And Ben is actually here tonight. Well, I think it's time. Let's light up this building and let the DNA sequences serve as a beacon of hope for families here and around the world searching for answers, hanging on to hope. Ready? DNA pattern on the windows of this building does two things. It proclaims to Kansas City that we're working on the diseases and conditions the children bring to us. But it also affects the people inside the building. They're infused with light that filters through the DNA code of the patients. They know every day what they're working on and why they're working on it. When I flipped the switch, it felt amazing. I was very happy to see my DNA on the side of the building. The building was just beautiful, it was stunning. For our family to be part of this research, I felt incredibly grateful and also just really proud to be a part of this grand experience. Wow, the lights are on, the building is open. It is the moment we have all been waiting for. But I think it's really important as we bring this evening to an end, that we think about those who've been waiting the longest for the Children's Mercy Research Institute. It's the families of Children's Mercy. Some of them are looking out of their window onto this building as we celebrate its grand opening, knowing that the work happening in this building will make a difference for their child. Your generosity and this building bring them exactly what they're seeking, hope. So thank you, Kansas City community. Thank you for caring. Thank you for caring for the kids of today, the kids of tomorrow, and for generations to come. We appreciate you. And we look forward to having you join us in the Children's Mercy Research Institute as soon as we are able to gather in person. So until then, thank you so much and good night. <laughs>